Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. If you're new to unity, if you grew up like I did in the evangelical world, the word of God was only the Bible. That's what the word of God meant. But there is a deeper meaning that we have a direct connection to spiritual wisdom, insight. There is a the universe is forever speaking to us, always proclaiming good over our lives. In the Talmud, in the Jewish tradition, there, it says that over every blade of grass stands an angel whispering, grow, grow. That's true for all of us that we are not alone in this world. We are not alone on this journey. There is an invisible support and love and power that is seeking to give itself through us and to us. And we have to find our listening. We have to be willing to hear this message of love and affirmation and support. This is not the talk I wrote. <laughs> But it's going to tie in, I have a feeling. Hmm. Just moved by that. I, sometimes at church, I don't get to go to church because I'm working. <laughs> but I, I got to go to church during that song, and I felt so moved by it. This is the part two of a two-part series I'm giving on the 12 steps. I'm calling it 12 Steps to Freedom. And it's not just for people who are chemically addicted or addicted to gambling or debtors or all of those many, many, many ways that people have used the 12 steps created in Alcoholics Anonymous to find spiritual freedom. That uh, Father Richard Rohr wrote a wonderful book called Breathing Underwater. And in this book, he reveals that he himself is not an addict or an alcoholic, but that these steps contain timeless spiritual truths and these practices can free us all. And he says, by the way, we're all addicts. We're all addicted to our own way of thinking. And if you don't know that that's true, you should read up on the Enneagram. <laughs> we we're, we're find out that there are really nine types of people and 27 subtypes. And so I, I remember uh, Suzanne Stabile, in one of her podcasts on the Enneagram, she said, before I realized that people were different from me, I thought when they didn't see it like me, they were just stupid or wrong. <laughs> we're all different. We're all different. And we sometimes assume that the way we're seeing it and the way th we think it is and the way we think people ought to be is the only right way. It got quiet on that one. <laughs> and so this, this path of these 12 steps of personal responsibility, of conscious contact with God, of rigorous honesty, that's a tough one. That if we're willing to take up these practices in our own way, we will free ourselves from our addiction to our own way of thinking. But it may not be fun. Remember, I think it was uh, uh, Gloria Steinem who said, the truth will set you free, but first it's going to piss you off. <laughs> yeah. You, in case you didn't know, you're no longer in the Baptist church. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I've, now I can start my talk, and I've got a lot to get to. You know that Bill Wilson was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. You may not know that his wife, Lois, founded the companion group called Al-Anon for the companions and family members of alcoholics. Well, there's a new 12-step group for people that talk a lot. It's called On and On and On. <laughs> And I probably qualify. So I'm going to get right to, back to my, to my message here and share with you what I was. So we, last week we talked about the first three steps and the uh, qualities or the way, states of being I talked about were powerlessness, that we have to realize that of our egoic power, we can't fix our lives. 
None of us can, no matter what we're facing. On our own uh, limited human perception and strength, our false self does not have the tools necessary. We are powerless to change our lives. But there is a higher power. I call that power God because that's the biggest word I know. But it is beyond names and it is beyond any conceptions that a human being has about it. But it is that power may be able to fix this for me. And so the second step we talked about having faith, that I'm willing to turn my life over to something I cannot see, requires faith. And that is surrender, which is the third step. So today what I'm going to be talking about, once we've made that decision to turn our lives over to God, as we understand God or as we misunderstand God, then we have to be, be willing to look at things differently and to take things up a little differently. And there are some practices involved here that are really about um, housekeeping, about beginning to see where we've um, been maybe not as high-minded or as right-minded or as loving as we could be. We have to be honest about those things. So we're going to talk about honesty. We're going to talk about responsibility. And then lastly, we're going to talk about conscious contact with our higher power. So for, I'm going to read for you steps four and five as they were originally created. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. That does not sound like fun. And then five, uh-oh, I, I wrote the wrong one down. Let's see if I remember it. Uh, what is it? One second. You don't have to identify yourself. I, I thought I'd, I copied the wrong thing. I really do know it, but um, in this moment... It is not coming to me. I want to get, I hear you whispering to me. <laughs> Number five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. That's even worse. <laughs> it's bad enough to make, to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of all the things that I've done, but then to tell somebody about it? Good grief, what is this? It's honesty. It's being willing to tell the truth of our human condition. We talk a lot about speaking the spiritual truth, like word of God speak, that I am wondrously and fearlessly made. I am made in the image and likeness of God. We talk that a lot, and we need that. We need to know the spiritual truth. But we also have to tell the truth of our human experience if we're gonna heal it. You have to feel it to heal it, and you have to speak it. You have to find some way so that we get it out of our head, because here's the, the word that it was nowhere in this, the step, but it's really what's keeping us bound up. It's shame. We're ashamed of things we've done. We're ashamed of the way we've behaved. And so we want to keep that inside. We don't want to tell anybody about those things that we hold in shame. But the problem is, here's where many of you know this phrase, we're only as sick as our secrets, it is our, our unwillingness to speak about what we've done that makes us feel that shame and keeps us bound up. We get to feeling like nobody else has ever done this. I'm the only one that's experiencing this. Here's what Brene Brown says about it. If you put shame in a Petri dish and cover it with judgment, silence, and secrecy, secrecy you've created the perfect environment for shame to grow until it makes its way into every corner and crevice of your life. But if, on the other hand, you put shame in a Petri dish and you douse it with empathy, shame loses its power and it begins to wither. Empathy creates a hostile environment for shame, an environment it can't survive in because shame needs you to believe that you're alone and it's just you. So how do we get from searching and fearless moral inventory to admitted to God and to ourselves and to other, somebody else well, the exact nature of our wrongs. How do we get from that to empathy? But here's the secret and the way that this thing came about. So before Alcoholics Anonymous, there was a group in the early 20th century called the Oxford Group. And they were not necessarily alcoholics, so there were some who had found a recovery in that program. But it was a group of Christians seeking to live as the way that they could best figure out the first century Christians lived. And the first, you may not know this, but the first century Christians were communists. Not in the, the way that you're thinking about, but they lived communally. They sold their good and cared for one another. 
And in the Oxford group practices were rigorous honesty and accountability. And so those, and Bill, Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob had both been involved in those groups. They were not able to stay sober there, but once they did achieve sobriety and they started sharing what they knew, they took those practices up and they discovered that it didn't make people feel more ashamed, it, it set them free from their shame. And who better to tell what you as an alcoholic had done than another alcoholic? Someone who's been there, done that. When I have stepped into this practice of revealing my own secrets to someone I trusted, do you know what I was always met with? Empathy. I was told, you know, Michael, that's just so human. I've done things like that. And then I just something in me could just relax and go, I'm still not proud of it. <laughs> I am not proud of the things that I have done. But I understand that it's human to make mistakes. And once I, and Brene Brown also talks about if we're willing to speak it, then that shame cycle is broken and it, it really just, it has no more place to, as she says, creep into those crevices and corners. I have a friend of mine in recovery, he passed away now, a former FBI lawman, and when I was, knew him, he had already been sober for 40 years, and he told me, he said, Michael, there were secrets I swore I would take to my grave, and now I've spoken them from a podium in front of 2,000 people. <laughs> It had no more power. So I'm, there's a, the, we do talk about rigorous honesty, but we don't mean ridiculous honesty. You don't want to just tell anybody you see all the terrible things from your past. <laughs> but if you're, if you're feeling bound up in shame, you need somebody to talk to about this. There's a, a companion book to the uh, big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's called The 12 Steps and 12 Traditions written mostly by Bill Wilson. He says, AA experience has taught us that we cannot live alone with our pressing problems and the character defects which can aggravate them. If we have swept the, spot, the searchlight of step four back and forth over our lives and it has revealed in stark relief those experiences we'd rather not remember, if we have come to know how wrong thinking and action have hurt us and others, then the need to quit living by ourselves with those tormenting ghosts of yesterday gets more urgent than ever. We have to talk to somebody about them. These steps are created in succession, so we do the searching and fearless moral inventory. We look at ourselves. Where have we been holding on to old pain? Where have we been holding on to old shame? And then we want to release it. This is there's a whole cottage industry in Ireland of people that travel there from America to do their fifth steps with a priest. <laughs> Did you know that? There are Catholic priests who, they just welcome these people that they don't want to share it with their, their husband or their wife or even their sponsor here. They want to go to another country just to give themselves the relief of it. Therapists are great for this very reason. <laughs> to create that trusting, loving relationship with someone who's going to actually give you unconditional positive regard. It's one of the touchstones of talk therapy. And there's a healing in it. The last thing I want to say about this piece is from the Gospel of Thomas, one of the Gnostic Gospels. And in this, Jesus says, if I can get to it, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth shall save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. We're only as sick as our secrets. And so to find a safe place where we can unburden ourselves of the secrecy, and then we can find the empathy and the shame has lost its power in our lives. I'm going to read these next steps in succession just so you can uh, see where we're going after we've, we've uh, made a, yeah, after we've told our secrets to our, whoever it is, the priest in Ireland, whoever. Number six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Humbly asked him, number seven, to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. I know people are going, bring back that prosperity series. What are you doing up there? All of these steps are about 
responsibility. I have to get honest about what I've done, to get honest about those places where I am, I am just not fully living the Christ self within me. I've made mistakes. Got to get some empathy around that. And then I can begin to even see who I've harmed. This is responsibility. I've showed joke before that there's like a little, uh, what do I want to call that? It's like a bait and switch when you come and step into 12-step recovery. They say, it's not your fault that you did these terrible things. It was the disease of alcoholism. It makes people do these things. And so that gives you the sense of, oh, I'm okay. And then they say, but you're responsible for every single thing you did while you were drunk. <sighs> and again, this is uncomfortable for any of us, whether, and you don't have to drink a lot to cause harm for other people. Have you noticed this? <laughs> that our actions and our words, no matter where we are in life, we have caused harm to other people. And to be able to willing to, to say, I have made mistakes here. And one of the reasons we don't see it is because we have this stance. <laughs> I'll apologize when they apologize first. They started it. Do you feel how closed off this is? Have you ever heard the phrase, it takes two to tango? I, I, don't, I love watching videos of tango dancers. It's, but that's really what happens in these interactions where we have harmed others. And yes, many times they have harmed us. Yes, be, we have been victimized and traumatized by the actions of others. But if there is an ongoing relationship, we were taking part in that. And you're not being asked to take responsibility and make amends for all of it, just your part. And here's what happens. Boy, it's quiet in here today. <laughs> here's what happens. This rigorous honesty, this willingness to make amends, to take responsibility and accountability for your actions, honesty and responsibility restores integrity. Honesty and responsibility restores integrity. And then you can just be right-sized. You don't have to think of yourself as the worst thing that's ever been. You don't have to think of yourself as the greatest thing that's ever been. You just get to be human. And this is true humility. And there's so much openness when you can just be who you are. Nothing to hide, nothing to prove. My friend Melinda wonderful minister in Dallas. I'll be speaking at her church when she's on sabbatical this summer, one Sunday in August. And she, we were at a retreat together and she had done some processes and she was sharing with the whole group. She said, when am I going to stop proving myself and start being myself? And that's all this is asking us to do. If we're honest about where we've made mistakes and we're willing to let God transform us and heal us, and if we're willing to take responsibility and make it right where we can. And there are some places we can't. I was told sometimes what I need to do is a living amends, which means stop doing that to people. <laughs> Just don't do it again, but it might cause more harm to go back and dig up the past for that person. And you get to determine that you want to be able to breathe easy. And our time here is limited. I don't know if you knew that. You know, the old joke. Well, it's not a joke. It actually happened. Robert Fulgham, wonderful author, he was a pastor, and somebody came into his office and said, I've got bad news. I just found out I'm going to die. And Pastor Fulgham said, I'm so sorry. How did you get to be this age and just now learn this? <laughs> Don't you want to leave this planet clean? Don't you want to be free of those old resentments and fears and blame and shame? This is the path of freedom that 12 Step Spirituality offers. And you don't have to join a group, you don't have to go to meetings to begin to practice this kind of living, looking at yourself honestly, finding someone you can trust to, sh to talk about it. And then be willing to make it right where you can. Not this. And say, I messed up. I just want to say that I, I was wrong. That 10th that step continued to take personal inventory. And when, not if, we were wrong. 
when? Because we continue to mess up, or is that just me? Have you all ascended and you've gotten past that? No, we continue to make mistakes. And you can build this muscle of, okay, I messed up. I'm going to be honest about it. And it's not fun ever. (laughs) It's really never fun to make amends. That I've done it enough now that I understand if I'm willing to be rigorously honest, to take full accountability and responsibility for my part, not for other, other people's part, then there is such freedom. There is such freedom waiting for us. The last two steps. 11, sought through prayer and meditation. Did you know that meditation was in the 12 steps? You might not have known that. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out. And 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcohol, other alcoholics to practice these principles in all of our affairs. And so I would say, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of living this way, we tried to carry this message to others we could help. Others we, who may have had similar experiences to our own. Spiritual awakening is the result. Remember we said honesty and accountability or responsibility reveal or restore our integrity. And when we know who we are, and this is where I'm so grateful that I had both the 12 steps and this philosophy at the same time in my spiritual growth path, because it's not just a higher power, it's an inner power too. That I am made in the image and the likeness. That Ernest Holmes said that the highest most God and the innermost God is one God. That this spiritual power, my true self, not the false egoic self that's been trying to manipulate the world into doing what it wants, Although I'm still, a, I, I was doing the Unity Prayer Partner training yesterday, and I don't remember what it was I did, but it was pure mystical manipulation. I don't remember. I just said, oh, I caught myself, though. I did at least, honestly, I know about it. We don't have to manipulate anybody or anything if we're willing to just take these steps up and be who we are and trust that the power within us knows exactly how not only to live a life of freedom and fulfillment for us, but of service to others. We become the light that shines for other people so they can heal their stuff too. And you don't have to be a minister or you don't have to do any of those things. You just get to be that. This is the parable of the acorn. One little acorn was telling his friends and acquaintances, one day I will be a mighty oak. I'll shelter birds and animals. I'll survive many great storms. I'll tower over this land for centuries. And I'll create a legacy of other strong oaks that will come from me. And they will carry forward for millennia. The other little acorns looked at him dubiously and they asked, How are you going to do that? I don't know, he said. But I think it has something to do with being buried in the ground and something to do with letting myself be cracked open. Within you is the seed of healing, the seed of greatness, the seed of rising above every problem you've ever had and being a light to shine for others. The last thing I want to say in this whole series, and like I said, I could have done a year on the wisdom of these 12 steps, but the, there's in the 12-step tradition, there is the program and there is the, the fellowship. That it's not just the doing these steps on your own, but building relationships in community to do it together. That's really the secret sauce, is that you find people of of like experience and like mind who are also seeking to live better lives of freedom, and there's just something about that that's incredible. And that, too, is like us. We have our teachings and we have our community. I love where it says in the step 12 that spiritual awakening is the result, and we tried to carry this message, help others. This is our um, statement of being, or not our statement of being, what do we call it, our purpose. Thank you, Reverend Shirley. This is why we exist at Unity of Houston. In community, we nurture and empower each other, transforming our lives that we may serve the world. That's what we're here to do. We're here to lift each other up when somebody else is, and I see it. I see people come in here not knowing a soul, and then a few months later, they have made the best friends of their life who are walking them through the most challenging things. This is what we want to create here at Unity. 
One of the ways we do that is through our Unity Prayer Partners program. I'm going to go ahead and invite the Unity Prayer Partners to make their way up here. I love that Acorn story because it reminds us that there is a seed of something greater already in us. You know, there's a saying, you can't, you can't count, or you can count the number of acorns on an oak tree, oak tree, but you can never count the number of oak trees in the acorn. And these are people, come on out, these are people in our community who have committed to holding the truth of your acornness, of your nuttiness. Yes, that's what they're here to, they are here to know the truth for you when you can't see it for yourself. They are here to remember for you that there is a higher power, there is a higher wisdom and a, free, a freedom in you that you have not yet been able to access in your spiritual path. And the way they do it is by praying for you. In unity, we don't pray asking God to give us something we don't have. We pray from the indwelling God, revealing what's already here. So yesterday, we had a training. We all got together, and we worked on this practice of affirmative prayer. And we also, not only did we train, but we also committed. And so these beautiful people have committed to serving you. You see them up here before and after the services, and you can come get a prayer then, but you can also sign up to receive a monthly text or a phone call from them just to ask what they can be holding for you, and I encourage you to consider doing that. Um, do we have any of our retiring Unity Prayer Partners here today? Okay, so if you are complete with your training, would you step forward, and Gary, would you play for us? So Kiki and Roseanne, just come on up here. We just want to thank you for your service to this community in this way. You're not leaving the community. No. You're just leaving this ministry, and, I'm, and I might even get them back at another time. So we love you. We thank you for your service. Let's give them some love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know our er, dear Ermi Waddell is also one of the, the people that is completing her term. Now, do we have, can we have our new Unity Prayer Partners, people who were just trained yesterday, would you mind stepping forward and stepping up? Let's give them some love. Incredible. So here's the thing, you're not going to be taking a test on this. I, I shared with them over and over again yesterday in the training. I've been learning this practice of affirmative prayer for 32 years, and I'm still like just learning. I'm just learning how to do it. Thank you for your willingness to know this truth for us and just know you. You see how many people got your back? All of us, we're here to support you, and they have yours. Let's give some love to our new new members. Thank you. And now what I'd like to do is offer a blessing to all of the, our Unity Prayer Partners, who are, all of those who are serving this community. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you would extend your hands and your love and appreciation. And I'm just going to speak a prayer because I know how to do that. I've been trained. <laughs> In this moment, I recognize there is only one life and power, and it is the life and power of God, and it is everywhere present, everywhere available, and it is what I am. I am its uh, expression. I, it's what everyone here is. And so this beautiful team of spirit beings have stepped into this calling of holding this truth for us all called the Unity Prayer Partners. What I know for them is that their, their willingness to serve opens up the channels of blessings for themselves and for this community. Great healing occurs through the prayers spoken by these beautiful souls. This entire church is raised, lifted, transformed, evolved through their consciousness. And so I speak a word of blessing, a great word of gratitude for who they are and what they bring. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. Thank you, Unity Prayer Partners. We love you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.